All right. Hey, you can see, go ahead and grab your Bible. Turn to the book of Proverbs. Uh, It's so great to see you today. Let me offer my own personal welcome to all of you who are guests. I've already met some of you who are brand new today. And if you are, I'd love to meet you after the service. I'll be back in the, in the, in the lobby back there in the narthex. Would love to meet you. Some of you here from Texas OU weekend, uh, Oklahomans probably, I think they got out quick, just left fast and out of here, uh, which is, which is good. We love our Oklahomans, but if you are here from Oklahoma or a UT fan, you came into town. We're glad that you're here today. Um, As Rodney noted, we're going to focus in on a specific decision that you're seeking to make. If you're able to do that, you have a big decision. Maybe it's a macro decision. It's a season of a decision making moment that you need to make. We're going to see how God's word guides us. Uh, The more you can focus there on that, the spirit will lead you perhaps as we go. The more you can apply this message in the moment. In fact, I'm going to guide us in prayer along the way through this service so we can practice the presence of God and his guidance in our lives. Uh, some years ago, I read a book um, that told the story of Stephen uh, Callahan. He uh, was, it's a survival story. And the moment I tell you um, the title, it, you'll realize this doesn't go well. Um, the title of the book became a uh, New York Times bestseller on the list for about 30 weeks or so. Uh, the book was entitled Adrift. Um, now, somebody made a film about another couple that was adrift, but this chronicles his story in 1981. Um, Stephen was on a 20-foot boat, sailboat, uh, and he was, he was leaving the Canary Islands on his way to Antigua, across the Atlantic, in a boat that he built, by the way. Came upon a storm about a week in, and uh, his boat sank. He ends up on a six-foot raft, with what little supplies he had, ran out of food quickly, no water, and so the rest of the time he's adrift out in the heat of the sun during the day, trying to distill water, catching fish as best he could, fending off sharks, terrifying dark of the night for 76 days. He went 1,800 nautical miles all the way across the Atlantic until he almost ended up where he was going. He just north of St. Lucia. He ends up being, being found. And then he recovers and he goes on to tell his story, of course. Now, we all love survival stories. Maybe that's why I was all into it. I thought, how in the world, with all the mental anguish, the challenge, the physical exhaustion, how did he make it? But you know, stories like that might be inspiring, but that is no way to live your life spiritually. Many of us, even here today, you might feel that you're adrift a bit today. You ever feel directionless? You ever feel like you you really don't know how to make certain decisions or need to make some decisions that will actually help you live on purpose and with meaning in your life? Some of us have been through 76 hours. We've been through 76 days really wondering, Lord, what are you doing? Or, Or maybe even drifting ourselves, not really pursuing him at all. Maybe that's where you are today. Some people live 76 years of their lives, aimless, directionless, not pursuing the Lord and his plans for us. How do you make decisions? How do you make wise decisions in your life? We're looking at Proverbs uh, all the way up till Christmas time. And we've we've said this this, uh, series is entitled Ancient Wisdom for Modern Times. Now, the moment that I say ancient, and by the way, Proverbs was written mostly by Solomon and others um, 3,000 years ago. Now, here's what we are likely to do at times. Uh, Unknowingly, we'll approach scripture and think, well, that that was a long time ago. I mean, we've got so much more knowledge now. We have so much more information. It's what C.S. Lewis called um, chronological snobbery. Where the latest, newest thing is better and actually discredits things from the past. We all do this. We go out to get the latest iPhone or the latest thing. You all, a lot of you know this. You get the latest appliance, not as good as ones that were built in the 50s and 60s, right? Hang on to what you have. Sometimes it's not best. In fact, often it's not best, certainly spiritually. It's not best to always, the newest, latest, greatest thing is not the best thing. David French is a cultural commentator. He calls it recently, he's called it recency bias is what it is. And what's happening, even when you Google something on your computer, algorithms and such work in such a way that the latest post, the latest um, article will come up. 
and you'll be reading things that are recent, not the best information that you're actually looking for on a particular subject. This can happen in our lives daily, always looking for the next best thing. And we're saying that, no, 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 in the, in the Proverbs, in the word of God, we find the wisdom we need. Because I would ask you this question. We have a lot more information today. Information coming at us. In fact, some have said it's doubling over the course of just days in our world today. It's overwhelming, in fact. But with all this information coming at us, let me ask you, are we wiser than we used to be? Are we wiser now than a generation past or two or three or how about this, 10 generations before us? I think most of us would say no. Herein lies the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Some of you have heard that knowledge or wisdom is applied knowledge, right? It is that, but it's much more than that because it begins with this particular verse, I think it's at the center of all of the Proverbs and it's said in different ways, but in Proverbs 9, verse 10. Let's all say it together. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. It all starts with awe of God taking him into account every single day of our lives with every decision we make. Do you live that way? Last week, Travis, myself, Rolando all launched us into this series and we said that, that wisdom is a gift. God is the source of wisdom, so we must come to him to get it. We said it's a guide. Of course, we, we sense the Proverbs that wisdom guides us, and it's a grind, meaning that it takes place in the daily stuff of life. And today we're going to see the tension of how we're trying to make decisions within the sovereignty of God. So Proverbs 16, if you're not already there, turn to Proverbs 16. I'm going to draw from the first three verses in particular, and then we're going to jump to a couple of other uh, verses that will help us along the way. Today you're going to see three practices. One is the first one is to, one to avoid. And then we're going to see one to, uh, to really implement. And then a third one uh, to, to embrace as a lifestyle. All right. So the first principle or truth I want you to see in decision making as you're thinking about your own life. We can't look inside. We can't look inside of ourselves. Okay. So what do we do? Look at what it says. Verse, verse one. The plans of the Lord, or the plans of the heart, I'm sorry, belong to man. But the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Okay, so this is another way of saying mortals make elaborate plans, but God has the last word. Now, immediately we see the tension of uh, God's sovereignty in the midst of our free will. We wrestle with how that really plays out. But here's what I would say. You know, we've talked about this at our apologetics class on Wednesday nights. True love is chosen love. God has given us free will to choose to love him or not. And within that framework, we enter into life with him to follow him and pursue him. And I, I would say, that here's a good analogy. I think that the, the will of God is not as much a tightrope. This will play out in our sermon today. It's not as much a tightrope as it is um, a playing field. Many people are frozen by decisions that need to be made. We don't know exactly what to do. And, and we need to understand that God is sovereign. There are certain decisions that we make. In fact, all, I could argue, we may, we may get off the tightrope, but God is saying, hey, listen, you, you love me and seek me and stay. I, I'd say it this way, it's not a tightrope, it's a playing field. He gives us boundaries within which we live, Stay in the boundaries, according to my word, and I will guide your path. Here's the amazing thing about God. He gives us free will and his plans are still accomplished. Only God can do that. This blows our minds and yet it's true. But the Bible tells us over and over again. So as we unpack, even today and throughout this series, we're going to teach you how to read the Proverbs. Because the Proverbs are, are like looking at a diamond refracted light that comes at us. You can't just buzz through the Proverbs. You can't swipe right through the Proverbs. You have to slow down as we're going to do today. And we look deeper into what's happening because the first three verses here of chapter 16, we're going to see the first line of each verse. This is often the case is the role of a human. Okay. The second line is God in response or in spite of our human actions or what we might think the tension 
is felt in each of the Proverbs. I'm going to spend some more time on this first point. We look inside and we see three tensions that you can write down. You have a place to take some notes. The first tension we see under this first point. Expectations versus certainty. Expectations versus certainty. The, the plans of the heart belong to man, but, but the answer of the tongue. God has the final word. So daily we manage unmet expectations, don't we? I've recognized this in my own life uh, recently. It just, it just helped me to be aware. Two things. One, when I'll enter into my day, I've got plans. It's on my calendar. I know exactly what I'm supposed to do. I hope to accomplish this thing, these things before I head home tonight. And what happens is, uh, you can imagine, this is for you, not just being a pastor. My plans are interrupted along the way. There are needs that come along. Now, sometimes I'll live with kind of this low-grade frustration every now and then, kind of an ambient frustration. I've learned to, I've learned to realize or really get deeper, dig deeper. What is, what is that? And sometimes, oftentimes, it's my expectations are not being met. I was planning to do this thing today, and this has happened. But here's the other thing that I've learned. Often those divine appointments, Watch this. If you see that God is sovereign over your life, even those things can be a part of what he wants you to do that day, though you didn't plan it. And so what I want you to see is oftentimes God will will allow you to be a part of what he is doing in the lives of others. And we have to be at times. There's tension there. There's wisdom in knowing expectations versus the certainty of God's plan. Often I'll go home at night realizing the interruptions were the most important moments of the day, the most eternal moments. We need to live that way. It's why in James 4, it says, you can plan to make money here, go to that city, make all your plans. But he says, no, 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 we should be saying, Lord willing, we'll do that. And then it's this idea, you don't have to always say, Lord willing, Lord willing, I'm gonna have lunch later. No, you're probably gonna have lunch, but Lord willing. But there's this attitude. And this mindset that if God wills, I am going to do these things. I will hold on to my plans very loosely, even when I am certain what God ought to be doing in this situation. There's this tension here, right? Unmet expectations can bring about a low-grade frustration, but they can also wreck your faith. If you do not trust the fact that God is at work in ways you cannot see. Listen, the fact that God is sovereign and leading your life should allow each one of us, if you truly believe that, you should be the most non-anxious person in the room, in your home, in your workplace. And people wonder, why are you at such peace? Because God is in control. But the first thing we need to recognize is that you cannot listen to your heart. You can't look in, and I know that runs counter cultural in our day. You do you, you be you, just, 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 just follow your feelings, follow your heart. This is horrible advice, by the way. And the Bible teaches that. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 17, nine, the heart is deceitful in all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? It's deceptive, it's misleading. That last question there in in that verse is really, who knows how bad it really is? Implying we don't know how bad. Inherently, we're bent towards sin, which is why the Proverbs 16, 18, the same chapter, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You can't look inside. What do we do? Watch this. The tension builds. Look at verse 2. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. So we go after whatever looks good, whatever's going to make us look good. That's how we guide our plans. But this is saying God looks at what is good. He weighs the heart. He weighs our motivations. You know, the most dramatic representation of this this truth in verse 2 is found in Proverbs 14, 12 which says there is a way that seems right to a man or to a woman, but in the end, anybody? Leads to death, not life. And I've noted the intriguing thing about that verse is not so much that it leads to death, but that it seems so right. So here's the next tension as they build. Perception versus reality. What we perceive is the right thing to do 
may not be the reality of what God sees because it says you, you look pure. It looks pure in your own eyes, but the Lord looks at all the way. He looks all the way through, sees exactly what's going on. We need to be humble. We need to pray, yes, specifically and pray with passion and with faith, but we've got to be humble. Years ago, in fact, I've referenced this before, Catherine Schultz, who's an author, journalist, writer, she wrote a book um, called Being Wrong, Adventures in the Margin of Error. She did a TED Talk, um, which became really, went viral, and she started by asking the question, what does it feel like to be wrong? And we say, well, it's embarrassing. Um, It's, gosh, it's humbling. It's shameful. Maybe even confessional. And she said, no. What does it feel like to be wrong? It feels exactly what it feels like to be right. The question is, what does it feel like to realize you're wrong? That's a different question. And too often, we even come before the Lord this way. And certainly we see this in in culture. What if Christians were the first ones to admit when we're wrong? When's the last time you said to a spouse or to a friend or to a child or to a, to a co-worker, I, I, was, I, I was wrong about that and I'm sorry. See, here's the thing. Christians should be first because if I'm wrong, I want to be the first one to know it. I don't want to speak lies and I certainly don't want to live lies. And so we have this, this perception and then the reality. We always have to approach the Lord humbly. Look at verse 3. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Now this word commit is interesting. In the Hebrew, it means to roll, literally roll, roll your plans. Our plans have a tendency to roll back to us, don't they? Here's the Lord's plan. Yeah, but I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. It's like prayer. It's like prayer. It, it works this way. If you pray according to God's will, listen to this. He will answer that prayer 100% of the time, or I should say it this way, how you think it ought to be answered will align with how he actually answers it. So when we pray according to his will, and we need to, we need to live this way, but Tim Keller has said this, listen to this, God will either give us what we ask for in prayer or give us what we would have asked for if we knew everything God knows. Is your mind blown just a bit? He, he's saying, listen, I'd say it this way. God answers all prayer. No is a full sentence. It's an answer to prayer. Wait is an answer to prayer. Not yet is an answer to prayer. Yes is an answer to prayer. The yes is when our will aligns up with his will. So we think he answered my prayer. Yes, he did. Because you prayed according to his will. Say, well, how can I know? I want to pray according to his will then, right? Yes, because this is why it's so critical that we're walking with him every single day. As we'll see here, the, 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 the Lord establishes our, his plans, our plans, his plans for us as we align with him. So in your decision making, in your prayer, as you're seeking the Lord's guidance, are you really walking with him daily? And have you come to him with your, your, your request and for guidance or have you just pressed on and he's, he's trying to clean it up after you and you're frustrated. Here's, here's the tension, temporal versus eternal. See, there, these three tensions show us why it's so hard to, to seek the guidance of the Lord and to receive it. Our temporal purposes don't always align with his plans. And so what we do is we make our plans and then we ask God to bless them. Don't we do that? So here's my first moment of prayer. I want you to just bow your heads and close your eyes. We're going to walk through this together as we press into the truths here. The first prayer is a prayer of trust. With this decision you're making, maybe it's a prayer of confession and repentance to acknowledge, Lord, I have not been trusting you. I haven't turned to you with this decision for guidance. Just, just pray a prayer of confession and trust right now.
Hand this decision over to him. Roll this decision to him. And allow him to take it. Amen. So we cannot look inside ourselves. Number two, look at this. We must look to the Lord. I can say it this way. You can't look in. We must look up. Proverbs 16, 9, same chapter, it says this. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. You see how these Proverbs, they're, they're in many ways offering the same truth, but from a different, different point, different, different vantage point. Over and over again, the Proverbs teach us that eternal wisdom is found in God alone because he's the only one who's eternal. Eternal significance in our lives is found when we walk with him. Now, in the ESV, which, uh, which we have here, um, it says steps. But in the Hebrew, this is interesting to note, there's a singular step. And so I would, I would think the writer is getting to here, the, the word of God is telling us that God is watching over. Listen to this. Every single step. He is watching over, superintending over every step in your life. Some of us need to be reminded of this today. Not a foot falls without God knowing exactly where you're heading and what's happening. And this should bring us great peace. Again, note it says the heart of man. We establish often our plans without God. So as we make plans, we give it over to him and say, Lord, we, don't let us move like Moses. Don't leave me out of here if you don't go with me. I'm wanting your decision here. And I'm going to walk with you. Some of us live, frankly, as functional atheists. We don't, we don't come to God with our plans and our decisions at all. And my challenge for you is financially or in your work, do you come to him constantly? Do you roll your plans to him, not taking them back? See, looking to the Lord means that you can approach your plans differently, not make your plans, but then ask God instead to give you his plans and then he will bless your plans. There's a bit of a nuance here, which is interesting. Notice it says the heart of man plans his way, okay? The way of a person isn't just like daily decisions that you're making. It's not just weekly decisions. The way is an entire lifestyle. Now, this is critical. This is critical to the, to the message here and to our understanding. You, you could say it this way. Um, I'm going to go to college and get a degree. Okay, that's a macro plan. Tomorrow, I'm going to get up, actually go to class so that I can get the degree. That's micro. But look at this, the macro plan is guiding the micro every single day. The way of a person's life is a course of life, it's a lifestyle. This is why we often talk about the way of Jesus. Living a comprehensive life that looks like his life. Then all of the micro decisions being made in your life are in that playing field and God is at work in your life. You're bringing glory to him. I, I say it this way, people ask me all the time, as a pastor, I get this, uh, different, varied iterations of the same question. What is God's will for my life about a specific decision? Seeking counsel. I need to make a decision about this like we're wrestling with today. I, and, and I say, there's a question before that question. There's a better question. The que even that question, what's God's will for my life, has this kind of self-centric, kind of my life, my, my, what is his will for me? The better question is, what is God's will? Full stop. What is God doing in the world? What is he doing in your life? If you're saved, you've received his grace. All of life now is an act of worship. Everything you do. This is the macro level to bring glory to him. Now that guides every single decision that I'm making. Proverbs, see, reminds us that God is sovereign over us. He invites us into his family and we walk alongside him. We, we align all of our decisions along with that great purpose to glorify him in everything that I do. Many of you were impacted years ago like me when Henry Blackaby taught us biblical truth that I suppose is not new, shouldn't be new. God is always at work around us. He's always at work in your life. Today, he's at work around you already. We don't have to invite him in to say, would you do something? He's already at work in our church. He's already at work in your workplace, in your family, in relationships. He is simply inviting us to join him in what he's already doing. And friends, you do that daily. 
You will live a life of purpose, glorifying him. What is God doing around you? And how can you join him? Proverbs 16, says this, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Ha. Saying you, you can roll the dice, but God knows what numbers are going to come up. And again, that should bring great peace to us. So again, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I want us to pray. I want you to pray. And this prayer is a, a just to say, Lord, I want to join you in what you're doing in the world. I'm, I'm overwhelmed, perhaps you're overwhelmed with this decision. Just release your life to him and say, Lord, I will join you on the macro level of what you're up to in the world. Just offer your life to him anew right now. Lord, we thank you for the peace that comes when we really focus on the larger purpose of our lives and not get lost in the, the small details that stress us out every day. We lay it all before you. In your name we pray. Amen. So we can't look inside. We've got to look up. And then finally, we've got to look out. We've got to look outside. We must look to others. So, so you can't look in, you can't look up, you've got to look out. Look at uh, Proverbs eleven fourteen. not in this chapter. It says this, where there is no guidance, a people falls, but in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. Friends, we are in desperate need of one another. I just want to say it again. God's great dream of the church is such a beautiful thing. It is prideful, in fact, to think you don't need community in your life. That, that is hubris and pride. And over and over again, the Proverbs teach us, you need to hang out with wise people, not fools. And a lot of us may be working or, or living around constantly around people who may look like they've got it together. They may be successful in the world. They are fools in the way that they're living their lives. We need to come back together with each other constantly so we can encourage each other. It's why constant worship together on a weekly basis is critical. It's why our, our, our time together in community, in a connect group, is so important. If you're not in a connect group, and if you don't have a core group of people that you're learning from and, and being with on a regular basis, can I say it? The Proverbs say you're a fool because you can't live this life that way. You can't have the direction of God apart from, yes, other angles and, and facets of his guidance, but it's through people through others that he literally speaks to us and he's doing it now and here's what I, I'd say to this that you know we all need to be looking for others that we can be pouring into I was at a next gen um, gathering or, or leaders from all over the world uh, this past week with TJ Morrow our next gen pastor at, at DBU we were with leaders from all over the world working with uh, Gen Z teenagers up into, the, into their 20s and the thing that marks every resilient uh, disciple who enters into their 20s, continue to follow the Lord, the thing that marks them all among five, uh, five measures is um, relationships with those across generations. Specifically, they have adults in their lives who are pouring into their life, not just parents. That was a marker. My challenge for many of us in this room is that we all can be discipling others below us. Who are you discipling? And I've said it before, we can throw rocks at Gen Z or millennials or whoever else, but if you're not actively discipling someone who's in that generation, it need to remain quiet because God is calling us all to do so. In fact, it says in Proverbs 16, 31, gray hair is a crown of splendor. It is attained in the way of righteousness. Meaning, you, older ones of us, it says nothing about bald, bald people. But anyway, um, those of us who are older need to be pouring into others. To those who are younger. Find someone young and invest in them. Every young person I know in their 20s wants to have someone mentoring them. Guiding them. And we all can be a part of that. Friends, we need each other. We need Christian community. Some of you, here's the challenge for you today. You need to join the fellowship of the church today. 
That's the wisest thing you can do today. You need to decide you're going to get into a connect group and you're going to start making plans now in obedience to do so. Because that's the wisest thing you do. Here's the thing. Some days I'm going to need you to believe for me. I'm going to, have, I'm going to need you to have faith for me. Some days you're going to need me to have faith for you. That's the body of Christ. And it's why when we come together and we sing to the Lord, I mean, we are empowered. Don't you feel it? I'm preaching to the choir. You need to be back next Sunday because every time we gather, we are empowering one another. We're saying, yes, I believe this. I forgot that, but I do believe that. I forgot. I'm, yes, this is how I want to live. So inspiring and aspiring. But watch this as I close. Wisdom is not an impersonal force. It comes as we walk with the Lord. And Romans 8, 28 is a verse we all know. It says, for, for we know that God is at work, right? We know that, that, that for those who love God, all things work together for good. And for those who are called and according to his purpose. And we often read that verse and we think, well, I guess God's going to do it. I mean, it's all going to work out somehow. And we enter into a passive role. But watch this. We often pull that out of context. It was written in context. The next verse tells us what the purpose is. The next verse says this. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, okay, determined ahead of time, knew ahead of time, determined ahead of time to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the purpose that he's accomplished. That's the macro purpose. Everything that you face and every decision that we make lines up with the fact, God, you are conforming into the image of us. Whatever comes my way, not all things are good in my mind, but all things work together for good. You need to be reminded of that today in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. In other words, we follow him in resurrection. Jesus, our perfect older brother, we pursue him. We walk with him. There is no plan B for the Christian. God is going to accomplish his plans and he's doing it in your life right now. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, it says, because of him, you are in Christ. If you have received Christ, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness from God, sanctification and redemption. Stephen Callahan ended up on a six foot raft for 76 days adrift. Listen, friends, you don't have to live one more day adrift, aimless and directionless. Give your life to Jesus. Receive his grace. He died on the cross so that you would be forgiven and you respond to him to glorify him in everything you do. You don't have to stress out over the decisions that you need to make. You need to not look in. You need to look up. You need to look out. Let's pray together one last time. What will you do? I want you to come before the Lord and you tell him, I'm challenging you because I believe and trust the spirit has been speaking in your heart. Tell him what you will do. How will you obey? Lord, we praise you for your spirit's guidance. We give our lives to you. What else could we do? Lord, help us to trust you even when things don't make sense. We lay our lives before you, knowing that your will and your perfect plan will be accomplished. And someday, we will see and know why. We trust you in the midst of it now. In Jesus' name, amen.